Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very talented actress all the way from Canada, Jane Wheeler. Jane was in um, a bunch of um, exploitation movies up in Canada. Uh, she co-starred with um, Rowdy Roddy Piper in Marked Man. She was also in The Neighbor with Rod Steiger, horror movie. Uh, she guest starred on Tropical Heat and Are You Afraid of the Dark a couple times. And uh, the one role I want to talk to her about that I absolutely love was uh, she played Sam Robard's wife in this uh, Lifetime TV movie, Obsessed, back in 2002. I watched that movie so much it got me through a dark period in my life. And I'm going to have her on today to talk about all of that stuff, and I can't wait. As January wraps up, it's been a pretty interesting month, and February will even get more interesting. So yeah, here is my interview with Jane Wheeler. Hey Jane, welcome to the show, how are you today? Hey Tommy, great, I'm just going to turn off my music. <laughs> Great. You can hear me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, I hear you just perfect. Oh, good. This is uh, such a great All honor. Right. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. So, going what back. What are you doing today? Oh, how am I doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Pretty good. Weird times. It is a very weird time. <laughs> Yeah. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Uh, well, let me see. Early on, um, you know, I think I was always doing little little skits and stuff like that. Um, when I had to do presentations in school as a kid, I would usually sort of do something pretty goofy, be, you know, in character. Yeah. Rather than just me, Jane, getting up and giving a presentation, I'd be like the, you know, the Loch Ness Monster giving a presentation on Scotland, you know. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I suppose I did, and, you know, little, little plays here and there. Um, but it was really only in high school where I, uh, I, like many shy kids, um, well, I didn't. I tried out for the uh, cheerleading team and didn't make that. So, <laughs> um, so I tried out for the drama club, made that, and uh, you know that's really where I discovered, um, you know, the joys of, of uh, doing doing plays. Yeah, power of that. I, I played football in high school, and I can tell you, being a, a member of a, of a team like football or even cheerleading, it's, it's, it's really not worth it with some of the people you meet in those um, clubs, <laughs> you know. I know, but as a teenager, you, it's so hard to know that and to see that, right? You're, you're, yeah. Or at least I was such a wannabe, you know? Oh, yes, me too. I wanted to be part of the cool gang, and I wanted to be a cheerleader, and I wanted to be in a fashion show, and... It just wasn't me, but, you know, you don't figure that out until a little later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were a football player. Nice. Or, or not nice, depending on your experiences, I suppose. It was good. It was mostly good. I, I had a great time. I loved, you know, all the traveling we did and going to all the uh, games and stuff. And, I mean, we were always losing, but it was fun. We had a great time. Who did you play for? Where, where did you grow up? I grew up in San Mateo, California, which is a small town, San Francisco. And I played for San Mateo High School, which is a very famous school. Everyone from uh, Merv Griffin to Chris Christopherson to uh, my mom's classmate, Dennis Haysbert, all went there. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's a pretty okay. legendary school. Yeah. But it's going to be 120. Cool. It's going to be about 120 years old next year. Oh wow! And it's still going strong. Still going strong. Yes, we've. They even rebuilt the school um, about 15 years ago. 
Oh, nice. Okay. And has it got um, good facilities like arts-wise, sports-wise, all of that? Or is it mostly a, a sports school? The, the drama department is probably the most uh, the famous part of it. And uh, the, the teacher I had uh, there, he's still there uh, all these years later. He's probably the, the longest-lasting drama teacher in the history of the school. Oh, wow. That yeah. is good work, I tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you know, here, I don't know about you, but here, you know, funding for things like that, drama clubs and whatnot, is... Uh, is, you know, is suffering, and um, many, uh, many a brilliant artist got their start in some form of, you know, um, extracurricular art activity in high school, so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm all for them. So after high school, did you go study yeah. acting anywhere? Yeah, I did, I did. Well, uh, here in um, Montreal, Quebec, well, in, in the province of Quebec, mm-hmm. um, we have a system called CGEP after high school, which is basically two years of sort of prep college, I suppose, for university. Um, or you can do a three-year program where you get um, a certificate, and that's, that's sort of a you know a vocational program. Um, mm-hmm. But I did a two-year program, and I, I majored in theater at, uh, at CGEP, and then I went on to study... Um, at a three-year program um, in Toronto at Ryerson University, and that was that was really good training, and that you know that really kind of solidified my choice. I, I was lucky because I you know the, I remember saying to my mom as a sixteen-year-old, I suppose you know when it was that time to kind of start making those decisions. What am I going to study? What am I going to be? Who am I going to be? And I remember saying to my mom like. Well, the only thing I really love is acting, but I can't, I can't really do that as a profession. You know, what else can I do? And she said, "Well, why not? Yeah. Why can't you? People do it. It's a noble profession. If that's what you love, do it." My, my father is is a professional um, classical musician, so I suppose we had, you know, we had arts in the family. But she was, God bless her. Well, she's still with us, but I mean, she is and was a huge. Um, supporter and believer and lover of the arts. So uh, so not only did I go into acting, but my brother did as well. <laughs> so <laughs> my poor parents, two, two daughters who went into, you know, business and, and uh, a son and a daughter who went into acting. Oh, that's awesome. But I'm very, very grateful for that support from my parents. Did, did any of your classmates go on to become successful in acting? Um... Well, uh, so from Ryerson, um, yeah, I mean, there are a few, I, you know, it depends on your version of success, I suppose, but, uh, like Eric McCormick from Will and Grace, oh, he yeah. you're above me, um, and, uh, Mia Vardalis, who did my big fat Greek wedding, wrote yep. it and starred in it, she was, uh, in the year below me, and uh, who was in my year? Well, you know, a bunch of people who are still working as actors, um, not necessarily huge, you know, names, but big names here in Canada, perhaps. Eric Coates and Tannis Burnett and yeah. Yeah, a bunch of really talented people. Yeah, because I've, I've interviewed a lot of people from the older uh, generation of, of, of Canadian acting. Um from let's see, from your generation, uh, do you know Natalie Radford? Natalie Radford? Yeah. Natalie Radford. Ah, uh, some of the shows. I'm not sure. Familiar? Who's she? She's um, okay. She's been she's been a working actress um, her whole career. She uh, she's a she's a short blonde. She's always changing her hair, always changing her accent. She's so talented. Uh, she doesn't really act as much anymore, though. She she finally fulfilled her dream of being an airline stewardess, and <laughs> that was her original trajectory. And then just uh, doing drama in in college just uh, just lured her to to being an actress. Nice. So yeah. she did that for a while, got it out of her system, and then went on to become a airline stewardess. An airline stewardess. 
for the last decade, yeah. She still does um, an acting job here and there if a producer or somebody she knows calls her and, and asks her to do it, but she's just primarily focused on, you know, traveling the world. Good for her. Yeah. <laughs> Probably a pretty interesting existence, although maybe a little bit limited at the moment, but that'll bounce back, too. Yeah. <laughs> So, let's see, you guest starred on Tropical Heat. You played the newlywed. Do you remember oh that? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought it was called Sweating Bullets. Did they change the title? Yes, that's right, Sweating Bullets. That's the proper name here in the U.S. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. oh, my gosh, that was fun. That was, uh, gosh, it, it, you know, exciting as a young actor living in Toronto to get picked up by a limo and flown south to Mexico and staying at a gorgeous resort and filming that. Boy, that was a good gig. Yeah, and Carolyn Dunn. Oh, God, that, I thought she was so talented and so beautiful. Oh, yes. Absolutely. And uh, Jessica... Jessica... She played one of the cops or detectives. Um... Mm. Can't remember her last name. She was good too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> was that a show that you? I I, I never really. Uh, did you turn it tune into that show regularly? No, I found out about the show when the internet came, and then there was there were some episodes on YouTube years ago. I remember. Yeah, because it was one yeah. of those. It was one of those shows. That was fun. It was it, it was one of those shows that aired on CBS, but I don't think it got a lot of publicity. No, I don't think so, although, you know, it was one of those kind of, it had its loyal loyal following, and it did, you know, pretty well. I think it, uh, I don't know how many seasons it did or, or whatever, but it seemed to be pretty popular, it was two, you know, for a, for a time. It was, it was two seasons. I yeah, was, God, it's funny, you know, it's, it's nice to talk to somebody who would remind you of the things that you've done. You go, oh, yeah, that! It all seems like... Um, another life sometimes, you know, like, uh, well, Obsessed, which we will talk about, and uh, shows like that, um, seems like a, a little ways back. I <laughs> uh, see, I can't oh. find, I can't find that, Jessica, but um, let me move on to well, The Neighbor. The with, Neighbor? With Rod Steiger. Oh my gosh, yeah, that was my first big role in the film, I would say. Um, and uh, I was pretty excited about that. Um, yeah, working with Rod Steiger and, oh my gosh, Linda, what was her name? I'm looking it up. Remember? Yeah, I'm looking it she up. Was, uh, she was in the Crocodile Dundee movie. Oh, Linda Kozlowski. Yes, Kozlowski, that's it, that's it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was fun. I'll tell you, do you want to hear a funny story about that movie? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, well, in the movie, uh, I play an obstetrician, gynecologist, Lin Linda's character's um, doctor, and I start to catch on to the fact that, uh, you know, this this other um, OBGYN is... is uh, has, I guess he's maybe taken over from me and she's become his client or something and, you know, unseen things are going on and, uh, she, she, you know, she, he's, um, he's uh, kind of not torturing her. But anyway, he's, you know, he's a bad guy. Um, yeah. And so I, 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 when I figure this out, I go to confront him about it to his apartment and, um, you know, we, we, we fight and then he kills me. He put the plastic bag over my head and suffocates me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that alone is kind of a cool thing to do. I mean, it's a cool thing anyway, and especially when it's your first big movie. So um, that was neat. But then they asked me if I would do the stunt, because they couldn't find a stunt woman, would I do the stunt where he throws my body off the balcony? Mm -hmm. And, you know, being a young actor and... Being a, 
uh, relative nudity, I'm thinking I, I should say yes. You know, they they, they can't find a female stunt woman, and I want to. You know, I don't want to. Whatever, it makes things uh, more more difficult for them. So uh, I should just do it. But I was terrified. I have a fear of not height so much, but a fear of falling. Yeah. So this was a, a pre, you know this was like maybe on the third story. Um, and they explained everything, and they said, oh, it's totally safe, and look, there's the crash mat on the ground, and I looked over the balcony and saw the crash mat, and, you know, was really kind of trying to talk myself into doing this. I was saying, yeah, I think I can, I think I can do this, I think I can do this, and they're starting to sort of get me, like, geared up to be flung over the balcony rail, and I just thought, I, you know, I will do my darndest, but... What if I don't land on that mat? What if I am flung off and I just miss it by, you know, six inches or a foot? Well, I'll break my neck. Anyway. Yeah. So at the last minute I said, no, wait, stop. Ah, I freaked out this. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> and thank God. Thank God. And so they got a guy and they um, put him in a wig and they threw him off. And uh, it looked a little funny, I have to say, <laughs> in, the, in the final version uh but nobody would have noticed and i just thought yeah that was the right call i've heard stunt stories like that yeah where they had to get a guy in place of a girl or something like that with a wig yeah it's pretty crazy yeah yeah but you know stunt people are so well trained and know exactly what they're doing and have the you know if you can go into it with the training and the confidence great but if you are thinking, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Well, then you might. <laughs> so, good thing I didn't do it. Yeah. Do you remember... No regret there. Yeah. Do, do you remember guest starring on Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh, yeah. That was a great show. That went on for quite a long time here. That was a huge source of employment for uh, a lot of Montreal actors. And oh, yeah, I Natalie was on there. Shows. Yeah, Natalie was yeah. on. She was on there. I remember one of the episodes you did. Bobcat Goldthwait was on there. Which one was that? Yeah, uh, let's see. He plays the Sandman, and that was um, the tale of the Final Wish. Oh, okay. Ha ha ha. I vaguely remember that. Yeah. I think I did uh, two or three of those episodes, and they were a lot of fun. They're, they're bringing it back. Did you ever... What's that? They're bringing it back. They're rebooting the show, I heard. Oh, yay! Yeah. Nice. It, well, it's, it's a good premise. All those kids sitting around the campfire telling spooky tales, and then, you know, them sort of being coming alive. It was cool. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see um, any of the series The Hunger? The Hunger? No. I remember the movie The Hunger with David Bowie and Susan Sarandon, though. Okay, well, there was a TV show that was filmed here um, for a while back in the late 90s, I think. And David Bowie hosted it, where he would do a little blurb at the beginning of each episode. Huh. You know, talking about whatever phenomenon was going to be um, explored in that episode. Uh, and so I did um, an episode with uh, Jennifer Beals. Mm -hmm. Remember her from Flashdance? Of course, one of the most gorgeous women of all time. <laughs> she <laughs> is. She is. Uh, up front and, and personal, she's gorgeous. And from a distance, she's gorgeous. And yeah, yeah. That, was, uh, that was cool. But she played... Um, you should look it up on YouTube. Um, anyway, she's in, an, uh, well, we are in an episode called And She Laughed. And she plays a woman stalked um, by somebody she thinks in her apartment building where the mail slot keeps opening. And she, she gets more and more paranoid as the show goes on. And I play her friend. Um, and that was, that was crazy because... Jennifer actually started, I mean, she's one of those actors who kind of really gets into her role. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, she started to get a little crazy um, during the shooting. And there was one day where we had a scene together in her apartment where I come in and I find her, you know, a mess. She's a mess because she's just convinced that this man is after her, he's going to kill her. 
and um, she's shaking and whatnot. And uh, so we, we do the scene where I'm sort of suggesting that I, you know, we call the police. And no, she refuses. Okay, well, why don't I, you know, get somebody here to help you? And no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so we do this scene, and then uh, towards the end of the scripted dialogue, she's really shaking, and she's really uh, sweating, and uh, I'm sort of start, starting to feel a little concerned for her as the actor. Um, and then she starts speaking in tongues. I kid you not. <laughs> like, you know, like something happened, and... She was speaking a language and trying to convince me of what she was saying, and it was not a language that exists. And I'm looking at her, and my jaw just kind of drops, and I think, what is happening here? And at one point, I kind of look over at the director, and he kind of mouths, keep going. <laughs> He's thinking, this is gold. Anyway, it was, it was pretty scary. Afterwards, they kind of whisked her off and calmed her down and you know I went off to my little whatever it was you know mm -hmm. um, trailer cubicle whatever and I uh, thought whoa that's when things get uh, maybe taken a little too far anyway yeah it was amazing though. I saw an interview she yeah. did uh, recently where she talked about all the stuff that she went through um after Flashdance and all the hashtag Me Too stuff she went through and, uh, I guess, substance abuse and all that stuff. So, yeah, I'm not surprised hearing that. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. No, she was, she was a, quite a brilliant, uh, you know, actor. Mm -hmm. And still is, I'm sure. That, then uh, you co-starred with Rowdy Roddy Piper on Marked Man. Oh, yeah, that was early on, too. Mm -hmm. That was maybe my second big film, Rowdy Roddy Piper. And, of course, I had no idea who he was, not being, like, a wrestling fan. <laughs> and I remember, I think, telling my boyfriend that I'm doing this movie with this actor called Rowdy Roddy Piper. He was like, what? That is so cool. Well, you mean you, uh, you never even seen him, like, on talk shows or anything? <laughs> I, I think, well, you know, subsequently I probably, once I got the part, and, you know, I probably look, looked him up and kind of found out more about him. But he was a gentleman. He really was. That yeah. was a good experience. I heard he was a very nice guy. Yeah, p people who worked with him and stuff. And um, I, actually, I actually know a podcaster up in Canada who interviewed um, his son and daughter um, on his show, and um, they did a tribute to him. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I mean... That, that was, oh, nice. And that was a pretty big part for you, right? That was, yeah. And I had, you know, um, chase scenes and gun scenes, and yeah, it was pretty fun. That was cool. Was, you, was your hair already that short? Or did you cut it for the oh, movie? Oh, I can't remember what I looked like in the movie. Did I have sh really short hair? It wasn't super short, but it was short, yeah, because you were playing a lawyer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I went through a, like, I had that Demi, Demi Moore haircut from Ghost, you know? I went yeah. through a phase where I had that haircut. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if that's what I looked like in Marked Man, but I loved that haircut. <laughs> you were in uh, Bar Barney's Great Adventure? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was fun. I done quite a lot of kid stuff, and I really loved it. I was in a... Well, that Barney movie was fun, and and um, I remember that you know Barney was was hidden away in a room like <laughs> ah sounds sort of funny to say, but like nobody could no if we weren't actually in the scene, mm -hmm. like, nobody could lay eyes on Barney. You know, he, they wanted to keep the sort of magical mystery huh. of Barney alive throughout. So on set, mm -hmm. like. You know, Barney was kept hidden in his own private, um, you know, room. Anyway, it was kind of it was kind of nuts, but it was a lot of fun. 
That's interesting. Yeah. He became a national phenomenon by the time my oldest nephew was born and he he really got into him and I've I I I was long past, you know, Sesame Street Mr. Rogers by that point. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, I mean Sesame Street. I'm sorry, but nothing beats Sesame Street. When I first saw Barney, mm -hmm. I mean, this is before I did the movie, I, I, I turned on the TV. I, maybe, I don't know, with my, I probably had a child, at least one by then. can't remember. Anyway, and somebody had mentioned this, and I turned it on, and I kind of thought, is this, like, did somebody who was on drugs come up with this? Is this for real, or is this like a Saturday Night Live Saturday Night Live spoof? I don't understand. <laughs> this is so weird. Um, They're oaks. But then, I, you know, my kid liked it, so we started to watch it, and then I kind of got into it. Speaking of Saturday Night Live spoof, there was a show on HBO that was on late at night when I was a kid called Hardcore TV, and they did a parody of Barney, where Barney um, is a raunchy stand-up comedian. This guy is wearing a Barney costume and telling very, very inappropriate jokes on stage, and people are just laughing like they're at like a deaf, deaf comedy jam show. Oh, it was hilarious, and it's still on YouTube. Oh, <laughs> uh, I Oh, well, I'm sure the producers of the Barney movie would not have been fans of that. Oh, I'm sure they saw it and they got mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, everything's up for grabs, right? Yeah. We'll laugh where we can. <laughs> well, you know, they... they... They, they made the suit a little bit darker, you know, and put a little bit of blue on it, you know, and stuff, so it wouldn't look exactly like Barney, you know. But the voice was there, you know. It was Barney's voice. Oh. Still, it's kind of sacrilegious. Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> you, you worked on um, Tales from the Never-Ending Story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was... That was cool, too. Gosh, thanks for reminding me of all these things. It's been, uh, it, you know, actors' lives are such a strange tapestry of, you know, TVs and movies and plays and, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's fun to kind of reminisce. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a great experience, too. And a lot of stuff, obviously, filmed in Montreal. I mean, I lived in Toronto for a while, and then I moved back to Montreal to do Shakespeare in the Park one one summer, mm -hmm. and ended up meeting a bunch of actors because Montreal is, is mainly French. There's a huge, you know, French um, theater and film and television scene here, and a much smaller one for Anglophones. Right. And when I came back that summer, I met up met a bunch of Anglophone actors who were, you know, make having making a living and, and doing pretty interesting stuff here in Montreal, so I moved back from Toronto. Um, yeah, and that was one of the projects, Never Ending Story. Yeah, oh my God, I loved the original movie. Um, I wanted to see the second one in the theater, but I didn't get to when I was a kid. But the original is just so wonderful. I've met the, the, um, the boy star, uh, Noah Hathaway, uh, I met him at a convention in 2016, and met him again in 2017. He was supposed to come on the show, and he never called me like he said he was going to. But, um, yeah. What? Uh, Let me talk to him. Oh, a couple people have done that. <laughs> I've had my share of people who said that they were going to contact me, and they didn't. Or people who just plain turned me down or canceled at the last minute. You know, it's happened a lot. Oh, that's no good. I mean, whatever. Sometimes people have reasons, but to not get back to somebody, I think, is very rude. Well, I've been I've been lucky with everyone I've gotten. You know, I can't complain there. Now, well, I heard Le Lenore Zahn. <laughs> um, I, I, I listened to her uh, interview with you, and uh, it was funny to hear her say, I knew that you tried me three times, and I'm finally on the show. And I thought... Yeah, Damn, I accepted right away. What's wrong with me? She, well, she, she can't play hard to get. Well, I, I, I chased her for like three and a half years, right? And she was going to do it. I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was like late summer, right? And then um, she called me to uh, to um, 
to uh, let me know she couldn't do it that day. And then um, she emailed me and told me, she's like, can we, can we put it off for a while? I got so much going on. And I was like, all right. And then when I touched base with her a couple days after Christmas, I, I couldn't believe how quick she was to respond because it usually takes her a while. And she, and we did it, you know, and she, she was on time and everything went smoothly. Um, yeah, she was a, a great interview. Uh, you should hear the one I did with Allison Darcy. Oh, I, I yes, I will uh, look that one up. Yeah, I'll oh, hear that one. we're very politically incorrect in that episode. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> oh, well, all the more reason to tune in. Yes, oh my God, we had a great time on that one. Nice, oh, I love Allison. Oh, yeah, she is, is, is wonderful. So, uh... We get to Obsessed. Um, as I told you in Messenger, you know, this movie got me through a dark period in my life. Um, af uh, after I graduated high school, I took care of my grandmother for nine months until she passed. And then I started junior college that uh, fall, and I just wasn't into it. And I was watching a lot of Lifetime TV, and uh, Obsessed was on, like, all the time. I eventually taped it because I just loved watching it. I loved the the complexity of the of whether or not Jen Elfman's character is telling the truth or Sam Robart's character is telling the truth or not. It's just a very well-written movie, and it, sh it should have been a theatrical movie, I think. Yeah, it was good. Because uh, you're right. I mean, the performances were... Jen Elfman was really good. They were so strong. Um... Uh, as was, you know, as was Sam Robarts, as was everybody. But yeah, it was really well written, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You're right. You, you you listen to it and you think, oh well, obviously she's telling the truth. Oh wait, no. Oh, hang on, what? Yeah. <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe not. Oh, where? Well, you know, you're, you're really, you're really kind of swung back and forth. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's pretty complex. Yeah, was that just a standard audition for you? Um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I remember going in and thinking, having having read the script and thinking, oh, this is something I would really like to get. This is something that I, that I want to be a part of. I don't think I knew at that point who the leads were. Mm -hmm. um, I just really liked the script. And so I think I had maybe three auditions for that, you know, first aud initial audition and then a callback and then another callback. And, you know, with each, each subsequent callback, you know, there were more people in the room, more producers and the director, of course. And um, so more pressure in a way. But, uh, yeah, I just really prepared and really put my all into that audition and was thrilled to get that part. Yeah. How was working with Sam Robards? Awesome. He was great. Really, um, just you know, a hard worker, a stand-up guy. You know, I, 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 uh, I really loved our scenes together. Uh, did, 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 and I remember sitting in the makeup trailer with Jenna Elfman uh, beside me, and I think it was day one. And uh, I think I told her at that point, you know, introduced myself and hey, how's it going? Uh, and told her that my my daughter was named Jenna. And that was kind of a, a launching point because at that point it didn't seem to be very a common name, you know. It was that was twenty well twenty some years ago, twenty years ago, yeah, about twenty years ago maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so uh, we got to chatting. But she um, she was she was uh, yeah she was nice. She was approachable, but she was you know she had a uh, she had a lot on her plate for that film. Uh, and uh, she was just one of those actors who was, you know, friendly, but only to a point because she had she had a lot to do. She had her her days were big, and she had had a lot to focus on. So her priority wasn't like, oh, let me be nice to everybody, you know, <laughs> nice to everybody around me on set. She was pleasant. She was polite. She was professional, um, but she was kind of, you know, in it. 
I, I met her, yeah, two years ago at a convention, and she was so sweet, and I told her how much I loved uh, her role in this, and she's like, oh my god, I, I was really crossing my fingers for an Emmy nomination, I love that character so much. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you know what? She deserved it. She was so good. Mm-hmm. I, I know, she's just... She really so, was. She's so charming, and just so... You know, um, so transparent. Um, Sam Robards too. He, his character. You know, you know, you, 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 he does a really good job of like, you know, of of um, co- of coming off as a complete louse of a husband. Yet he's not. You know what I mean? Like when you once you yeah. once you realize that he's telling the truth and she's not. You know, he's just got that way about him that like, you know, that el- elitism of the character. You know. Absolutely. Yeah, he was, he was very, very fine. Did, did he talk about his parents uh, a lot? No, he didn't. He didn't. That wasn't something that he talked about. I mean, I think he was, yeah, he was a, seems to me that he was um, pretty modest in that regard. Oh, that's good. You mean. know, he didn't flout that at all. I think I found that out. Maybe somebody else told me that, you know, on set or whatever, and I went, what? Lauren, <laughs> what? Um, that's, yeah, those, those are, those are uh, talk about a power couple. Lauren McCall and, um, Jason, and Robards. Jason Robards. Yeah. And, yeah. He's, and he's half... No, he, and he, no, no he, he downplayed all of that. And being half uh, siblings with Humphrey Bogart's kids, too. Yeah. Wow. That's showbiz royalty there. <laughs> Absolutely. V- uh, v- no, I, uh, I was, I was, I think we had maybe started working together, and then I caught wind of the fact that he was, you know, came from Hollywood royalty, and sort of looked him up, did some investigating, and went, "Wow, you, you know, from the way that he conducted himself, he was just, you know, he was just." Uh, as I say, not yeah, modest and just uh, hardworking, decent, and didn't uh, ride on their coattails, you know. Hmm. Yeah, v- Vlasta told me that when he worked with Jeddah in the movie, he j- he could not believe just how talented of a dramatic actress she was because he was aware of her being a sitcom star here in the U.S. But he just he could not believe how talented she was. Yeah, that was, I don't think anyone had seen her in that kind of a role before. And I remember thinking, Jenna Elfman is going to play that part? Wow, okay, that's strange casting, but okay. And uh, boy, oh boy, yeah, did she ever nail it? Mm -hmm. Richard Burton's daughter, Kate, she's very talented too. I've been trying to find her. Yes, she is. She is excellent. Yeah. And you also had... Very, very fine in that film. And you also had the legendary John Badham directing. That guy directed Saturday Night Fever, War Games, Stakeout, Short Circuit, so many good movies. Oh, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a gem, too. He, I remember him at my auditions and just kind of, you know, directing me in, in different ways. Okay, let's try it this way, let's try it this way, let's try it this way. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, fuck, you didn't like the, you know, the first take that I did or whatever. But, no, he really just wanted to explore flexibility in actors, how far they could go with, with you know, with one thing, and then, oh, let's, take, let's try something else, let's change it up, and, uh, you know, he was very, um, he was uh, understated and sort of gentle in his directing and his guidance, but he he knew how to draw good performances out of actors. Yeah, he was he was amazing. I liked that guy. Yeah, and also, too, was, I think it was the first time I ever saw Lisa Edelston um, was in this, you know, playing her imaginary friend. Oh, right. Yeah, she's awesome, too, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Here, here I am, just raving about the whole cast, but they were they were a good bunch. I mean, it's a great cast. Yeah, in the jail, in the jail cell. Another actor that you've worked with a few times is in it, Mark Camacho. Oh yeah, Mark and I have worked together a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's been my husband. Um, yeah, I mean he's 
you know, he makes a fine lawyer. He's played a lot of lawyers, cops, and yeah, you know, he's he's an actor who you know prepares really well and does some interesting stuff. Like yeah, actor's actor. Yeah. How? Yeah, absolutely. How was working on the remake of Journey to the Center of the Earth? Oh, that was well, um, uh, not that good. was cool. <laughs> stories but I'm not sure that I can share them I have to be careful um, but Brendan Fraser was was just lovely oh that was good um, yeah there was a bit of bit of trouble because we were filming uh, obviously most of that film was you know green screens and special effects but our stuff was um, outside here in Montreal in the daylight and uh we were losing light, and they were they were using um, 3D cameras, and it was fairly new technology, mm-hmm. so it was taking a while to figure out, um, you know, how to get the best shots from this uh, new style of, uh, of of camera, and I remember we were losing the light, and things got kind of tense um, on that set. And I know that uh, I was feeling intention because I had to be a bridesmaid in my sister's wedding the next day. And I had, I had told them, I can't, like, I can't work, you know, whatever that day was, but, you know, the following day, the Saturday, like, I, I can't work, I'm not available. They were like, well, you might have to, uh, you might have to if we don't get the shots on this particular day. And I was like, nope, 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 no can do, can't miss the wedding. Anyway, it caused a little bit of tension. Oh, there's been maybe six remakes of this movie, and nothing beats the original with James Mason and Pat Boone. Ah, uh, you know I've never seen it. I have to admit. Really? Oh, it's yeah. great. Oh, it is great. It is. It, it's. Uh, it, it. It's. 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 A, it's a movie that look. It looks like um, a, a B a B sci fi movie in historical context because the special effects are so bad and almost Ray Harryhausen like, you know. But it's not. I mean, it was a big studio film uh, for 20th Century Fox in 1959, and just you know James Mason's acting is so great, and he surprisingly has great chemistry with Pat Boone, and and Pat Boone sings one song during the movie um he sings a love song to a girl like early in the movie and it it is really great uh it's 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 most notorious because they eat they uh they have a duck um that 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 goes with them and they end up eating him for survival (laughs) oh (laughs) yeah uh i'm gonna have to try to track that down oh yeah it's out there it's on dvd or whatever it's it's a great movie yeah, they did a remake in the late 80s that was theatrical, and it only lasted maybe a weekend. It was terrible, and they've done a bunch of um, TV movie uh, remakes and stuff, you know, because they're always remaking Jules Verne uh, novels and stuff, like uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and stuff. Mm-hmm. So are, are you still... Wow, well, mm-hmm. uh, have you calculated how many movies you've watched in your lifetime? Uh, Do you have any sense of it? So so many. It's got it's got to be a couple a couple thousand, couple thousand ish maybe. Yeah, I I would say so. Cool. Okay. Well, if I if I have questions about like you know movie trivia, I'll know who to call. Oh God, I I, I encourage it. I, I want people to, to to come to me for movie trivia. You know, because I always. I always try to help my best. I I was a movie tri- I was a I was a trivia a bar trivia champion for years, and I would always kick everyone's ass in the the pop culture, movie, music categories all the time. And oh, I, I can imagine. I take pride in it. I take pride in it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm sure that every time you showed up for trivia, they'd be like, "No." Every time. <laughs> Every time, yeah. <laughs> so, so are you working during the pandemic? Um, well, things are pretty quiet here, work-wise. Um, I actually tend to do more theater than film and television, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, theater is a, is a big no-no, has been for the past uh, <laughs> almost a year now. Yeah. So, um, 
that's a real drag. I, I love live theater, and nothing replaces it. So, I mean, we've, you know, we've done some play readings and stuff like that, you know, online. Um, and I did a couple of movies last year. One was uh, in the fall, and it was about the October crisis, the kidnapping of James Cross. I don't know if you... Anyway, this is a... I vaguely Canadian heard something about that, yeah. Story. Yeah, that happened in 1970, where a, a British diplomat, James Cross, was was kidnapped in Quebec by um, French nationalists, people who wanted Quebec to be its own country. Yeah. And uh, anyway, it turned into a huge crisis. So there was a there was um, a project done about that, and I played James Cross's wife. So that was neat. And then I did a Hallmark movie in November. My first Christmas Hallmark movie, so fun. Nice. Not sci-fi, not horror. <laughs> I love... The opposite, hot cocoa and gingerbread. I love Christmas movies. Ah, uh, well, this one came out, like, we filmed it in, in November, and it came out just before Christmas, I think around the 21st of December or something, on the Hallmark Channel, so they, uh, yeah, it was a pretty quick turnaround, but that was... So, you know, bizarre to be on set um, with, you know, masks and goggles and all of that. Everyone is wearing protective equipment, and uh, they only take it off right before, you know, you rehearse with it and everything, and then just before the camera starts to roll, or even as the camera starts to roll, you know, a team comes in and removes your, disinfects their hands, removes your mask, removes your, your glasses and all that stuff, and then you shoot the scene and then... As soon as they yell cut, they're back with the masks and the, you know, so they, they're very, very, very careful um, on set. But weird, like even when you're sitting with the other actors in the kind of waiting room um, beside where you're filming, mm -hmm. you know, your chairs are, uh, you know, 12 feet apart or whatever it is, and uh, you know, you're kind of shouting at the other, so, uh, how's it going, Frank? What's new? <laughs> but it's a totally different feeling in terms of camaraderie when you're masked and sitting far apart. Oh, yeah. A weird, surreal experience. It is. But work. It's work nonetheless. That's cool, though. You got to do your first Hallmark Christmas movie, though. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they knock them out many uh, a Christmas season, I've noticed, you know, over the years. And I used to watch those on, on Lifetime, too. Um, at the same time, I was watching Obsessed all the time. I, they, they, were, they were showing some pretty good, you know, family Christmas comedies on Lifetime. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, there's such a huge market. Like, I couldn't believe it when I was told that, I think last year, Hallmark alone made 35 Christmas movies over the course of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, and that was half of what they normally would make. Well, I interviewed this guy a couple Mark? years ago, Peter... So huge. Yeah, I interviewed this guy, Peter Sullivan, a couple of years ago. He makes his living writing and directing uh christmas hallmark movies and he d he does other things as well in, in in uh film and television but his bread and butter is doing the christmas movies and every every one i've seen him do it's just it's it's better than the last like he he really knows how to write and put his mind to a good uh hallmark christmas movie hmm. nice well it's a talent, and, uh, you know, it's somewhat formulaic for sure, but um, there's such a huge market for it. And it's funny how, you know, uh, people kind of come out of the word works and, and, and say, oh, oh, Hallmark Christmas, I love Hallmark Christmas movies. People that you wouldn't expect, you know? Mm -hmm. Like for a, a distanced walk with a, with a woman I know um, and while I was filming and uh, mentioned that I was doing this, and... You know, she's a highly intellectual, highly educated woman who kind of, whatever, is busy with this, that, and the other thing, and volunteer work, and whatever. Anyway, um, and I told her, and she was like, what? Oh, my gosh, I'm so excited. I am obsessed with all of our Christmas movies. I kind of went, really? You? Said, oh, yeah, for years now. So, you know, you yep. just never know who's going to love those those films that a lot a lot of people and they are fun it's nice to sit down kind of know what you're getting mm -hmm. and uh just settle in and you know feel all i'm a warm and fuzzy inside 
I love holidays in general, and every um, holiday season, no matter what holiday it is, I try to get a guest or guest or maybe several, um, particularly at Halloween and, and Christmas, I try to get guests who are in, you know, the holiday themed or whatever that month is on here and stuff. And I've been, I've been doing that last couple of years. I love, I love it. I mean, I get, you know, 10, 12 people from Christmas movies during Christmas time. And I get sometimes up to 30 people of, uh, in horror movies during Halloween time on. And, uh, this past year I had maybe one or two people from Thanksgiving um, movies, and yeah, I, I love doing that holiday theme stuff on the podcast. It's it's just, it's a lot of fun. Oh, cool! Okay, favorite Christmas movie. Favorite Christmas movie? Does it have to be horror? Yeah, you can just give me one, only one. Does it have to be horror? <laughs> no, it can okay. be anything. Okay, favorite Christmas movie. Um. That would probably be um, Miracle on 34th Street, the original. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah, good choice. The only surviving cast member died about four years ago, or, or five years ago, just before I started the podcast. If, if he had lived, you know, a longer, I would, I would have been able to get him on here. Uh, the, the, the teenage boy that um, Santa Claus defends because the psychiatrist uh, tells him he likes to help people because of, of, of childhood trauma, you know, and then Santa Claus ends up hitting that psychiatrist in the face. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was the only surviving member, uh, and he died a couple of years ago. But Oh, uh, too bad. What was his name? Do you remember? Oh, no, I have to look it up. Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and um, I also love It's See, a Wonderful... I'm your, your trivia knowledge. It's a, it's a wonderful yeah. life too. I just interviewed Zuzu um, during uh, during Christmas time. That was a kind of an odd experience. She's kind of odd. Uh, next year I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to the uh, the boy in the movie. He's still alive, Jimmy Dawkins. And oh yeah. Yeah. So cool. I love doing hey. the holiday stuff. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say, speaking of Dawkins, it just reminds me of. Um... Did you ever watch any of the series Big Wolf on campus? No. No? Okay. Well, that was another TV series I did where I played the mother of a guy who turned into a werewolf. I, it was a comedy, um, but it was it was really good. It was, um, yeah, Big Wolf on campus, and I was Sally Dawkins. I'll check it out. Mother of the, this, this kid who would, when he got mad or when he got emotional or whatever, he would start to, you know, the fur would start to come out and the fangs would start to come out and... Anyway, it was fun. I just remembered his name now, Alvin Greenman. Alvin Greenman? Yes. Ah, uh, well, let's let's keep saying his name. That way, we we keep him alive. Uh, but he might uh, turn into Beetlejuice if we do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, you ready to play my secret silly game? Secret silly game? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Did you okay? Did you hear me play it with Lenore? Uh, uh. I don't think so. Was it at the very end? At the very end, yeah. I may not have. I may have thought that you were signing off. <laughs> okay. Well, now I'm scared. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Allison played it with me too. This is a series of silly slumber party questions. They border on risque, but they're really not. And how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, then you ask me the exact same question, I answer it, and you can comment on answers. I can comment on answers. Okay. Yes. It's just pure fun. Okay. Jane, are you ticklish? Yes, I am. Nice. Tommy, are you ticklish? Yes, very ticklish. Uh huh. What? Uh, can I ask you what the most ticklish part of oh. your body is? Oh, absolutely. Or is that risky? Oh no, no, you can ask me anything. Um, the soles of my feet and right around my navel. Oh, okay. Uh, 
okay, me too, the soles of my feet. Like if, like if, and my, my kids know it and every now and then they will tickle them just for fun and I get so mad. Because well, I hate it. I, I, I literally, I said, if you do that, I will kick you in the face. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to tickle them when they're when they're when they're babies, and then when they get older, they find out where your ticklish spots are, and then they start tickling you. <laughs> yeah, that's not fair. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, not allowed to turn it around on us. Um, it's true. You know, all these kids who are being tickled and probably hate it, yeah. and you laugh even though you even though it's not funny and you don't want to laugh and you're not enjoying it. It's kind of a you know a, that just that's the spontaneous reaction often is laughing. And I think of all these kids being tickled over and over again by parents and friends and aunts and uncles and think and probably thinking this is torture. I hate it. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, what is your, Next question. What is your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. Mm, what's my favorite part of the body? Huh. I would say the neck. Mm-hmm. You like the tickled neck? Tell me what's your favorite part of the body? <laughs> Mine is the belly button. Uh, you, do you love your own belly button? Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, before I had my car accident, I loved it a lot more because there was no scars around it, and it was a lot cuter. So, yeah. Oh. Shoot. I'm sorry you were in a car accident. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you that story but, after if you want okay. to hear it. I tell that your time. belly button is not as cute as it used to be. No, I, I, I wish I had a picture of the way it used to be. I, I probably do somewhere, though, but now it's just, ugh, I, can't, I can barely look at it now. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well. It's cute in its own, you know, morphed way. Mm-hmm. Do you have an innie or an Audi? I have an innie. Mm-hmm, same here. You? Yeah, it was it was it was an Audi when I was much younger, and then it just went in, you know, as I got older. Okay. Well, this is really personal. <laughs> but you're not uncomfortable, are you? No, I'm titillated. This is awesome. Okay. What color are your toes painted? They are not painted. Normally they would be, even like if I was, even this time of year, it's cold and snowy here, but if I was going to yoga class and groove class as I, as I usually would be doing outside the pandemic, then my toes would be painted as sort of a, chances are a dark kind of burgundy brown color. But at the moment, yeah, I'm just au natural. How about you? Same here, au okay. naturel. Um, I like to. Oh, natural. I started painting my toes when I was thirteen, and I haven't done it since my last trip to LA, which was in uh, September of 2019. Um, I did purple with sparkles because I like to go really elaborate colors when I do it. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Well, you might have to send me a photo. Oh, I got plenty of pictures of my toes painted. They're actually pretty cute. Okay, well, I think, uh, I, you know, I'd rather see your toes than your belly button. <laughs> even, even if I had an old one before the accident? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Uh, send me them all. <laughs> I'll, I like them all. I'll see what I can do. The purple with sparkles sounds, um, you know, pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is your best personality trait? I would say my positivity. I, uh, you know, I have my my slumps for sure, um, but I, I don't know. I I tend to be blessed with a generally positive outlook, and uh, I always think things are 
going to get better or things are going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good outlook to have. Yeah, I think so. How about you, Tommy? Um, I have empathy. I'm just a, a very caring person. But I also have no filter, which I'm, I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's kind of a fun trait. I, I wish I had a little more of that, to be honest. Like a little bit of like, I don't care what they think. I'm just going to say it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think I was taught, both, both my parents are, are Brits, and, uh, you know, was, I was sort of well-raised to be polite and to be, you know, well-spoken and just, well, yeah, as a kid, you know, speak when spoken to and all of that stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I have a little too much of that and, and not enough of a no-filter uh, attitude. So that's kind of fun. I mean, it, I, I guess it gets you into trouble sometimes, though. Yeah. This is not a hashtag me too question, so it's just a, it's just a, a fun, playful one. And if, uh, if it's too personal, you can decline. A couple people have. Um, what, yes. What's your favorite place to have a quickie in? Oh. Oh, man. Yes, very Canadian response, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it was a nice hike in the woods, you know, and uh, oof, that, that kind of gets you going. That's, yeah. what, that's what Allison told me. Yeah, she, she, she likes to do it in nature. I did it in nature one time, and a deer walked past us. <laughs> oh, cool. And did it just stop and stare, or did it kind of go, whoa? Yeah, move on. Yeah, like turned his head, you know, and I and um, I hope I hope he's still alive <laughs> after that. Uh, okay, Tommy, what's your favorite place for a quickie? Um, the very back last row of a movie theater. You know, I did that a lot in my twenties. <gasps> I couldn't do it now, obviously, but in my twenties, I did. Did you? And was it like like? That you've actually done that. I mean, was it like a packed movie theater, or was it pretty oh, empty no. in the back? No, no, you never want to do that in a um, in a packed movie theater. Um, no, it's always in um, a dead one, you know. And I just go there, go in the back, you know. If there's any, if there's nobody else there in the back and stuff, you're you're home free. And yeah, it was. It used to be really fun. Well, thank you for the tip, Tommy. <laughs> the people I've I've talked on my bucket list. Yeah, a lot of actors they 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 love to they lo they love to do it uh backstage too. I've noticed. Before the show or after the show? I have During no show. I have no idea. <laughs> I need details. <laughs> I I don't know. Uh I mean the do I be way too uh, I'm I'm always super nervous before I go on stage. Even if it's a play that I've done night after night, I'm mm -hmm. nervous. And uh, and I'm just focused, but I'm just sort of getting into the zone. And I just can't imagine doing that um, if you, you know, if you had a substantial role. But uh, maybe that's just the thing you need. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I doubt I'll ever try it. And then my favorite question, is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? <laughs> ah, these are funny questions. Uh, is there a stinky smell that just makes me gag? Well, tons of them, yeah. I mean, ah, wah, where do I begin? <laughs> I have a very sensitive nose, so lots of things make me gag. <laughs> um, I guess I would have to say, like, off the top of my head, a public washroom. I avoid them unless I'm absolutely desperate because just walking into one, mm -hmm. you know, even if there's all kinds of, you know, aromatic spray or perfume or whatever in the air to kind of mask the smells, I smell it and it grosses me out. <laughs> Other people's crap, basically. Yeah. Yuck. Yeah. 
worst. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's either it's either farts or dirty feet. Tell me, what is your smell that makes you gag the most? Either farts or dirty feet. Oh yeah, that'll do it. The classics. The combination of the two, I suppose, is <laughs> pretty pretty deadly. Yeah. <laughs> Now, is it your own or other people's? Uh, other people's. Okay. <laughs> that was your problem. If it was your own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you my, my uh, car accident story real quick. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I was a pretty bad drinker for a few years. Um, I had been a bouncer in a bar for a long time. Did, never even really drank as a bouncer, but then afterwards I did. And uh, one night, uh, things things had been really dark during that period. My mom and I lost our apartment. We were homeless. Um, my stepfather was a really bad guy towards the end of his life. He just died recently. And um, one night, me and this guy, who I thought was my friend, we were out drinking. And um, we uh, I fell asleep in the passenger seat. He fell asleep at the wheel. We ended up in the middle of the road, and we got out okay. But then a car collided with ours, and the impact hit us, and I got the worst of the injuries. Oh. Yeah. Oh. oh, my gosh. When was this? This was January 21st, 2015. Wow, not that long ago. Six years ago. Yeah. Wow, I'm sorry. That's awful. It It, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, though, because I... I needed to get sober, I needed to follow my dream, and I needed to, you know, just, just, you know, have confidence to uh, do the things that I wanted to do and stuff, because before that, I was just, I was just surviving, you know, and now, I'm just, you know, following my dreams, I've done this podcast since May of 2017, you know, my mom and I, we moved in here, you know, uh, a month before, and a miracle had happened, we got... A place to live up here in, in Reading, uh, which is, I, I hate living here, to be honest with you. It's just, it's a very conservative town, and a lot of people here are, are trashy, and it's it's not a great place to live, though. We, we do we do plan on, hopefully, making the move to Los Angeles, you know, in the future, but this is where I'm doing my podcast, and it's just been great, you know, 1,122 interviews I've done. Wow, amazing. It's been... That's incredible. It's been wonderful. Over, over the course of uh, three and a half, four years. Going on four years, yeah. It's been... Wow, good for you. It's been quite a journey, and I'm writing a book right now about my love of cult movies, and Obsessed is going to be the only TV movie mentioned in my book. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I'm glad. And you know what? I hope through this podcast that uh, a whole bunch of people will be curious and, you know, who's never seen it and, and uh, look it up and watch it. Mm hmm. Absolutely. You, you'll, you'll get a cult status, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- you know, I, I, I feel like I'm like halfway there. You know, I mean, it's funny. I've, I've, I've been to conventions uh, before, before the pandemic hit, and there were people who like recognized my voice, and it was really weird. Amazing. That's yeah. kind of fun, though, isn't it? It is. It, it, I don't think it wasn't. It, 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 I don't think it was a good thing. I think they were kind of making fun of me and stuff, but. It was it was pretty it was pretty surreal, you know, that they recognized my voice. Yeah. Well, the hell with them. Yeah. Got to focus on the people who who love you. Yes, I'm, I got a lot of great supporters, and I focus on them all the time. Good stuff. I'm glad. You sound like a pretty great guy. I hope oh. we meet you in person one day. I hope so too. Oh my God! So okay, I've met a lot of people I've interviewed out in LA and stuff, right? And then there's a lot of people in different parts of the world, like Canada or New York, who wants to who wants to uh, meet me. And <laughs> I've never even been to those areas, but I want to go to those areas someday. Oh, uh, 
I I hope you get to. I hope I get to. And I, too. I hope I and I hope I get out to LA one of these days. It's been a while. Yeah. Did you, did you ever try to move there? I didn't know. I uh, I mean, I've been there uh, a couple of times, but you know, right around the time that I started thinking about film and TV um, seriously, uh, when I started to really get into it, because as I was say, my a lot of my experience certainly to start with was in theater. Um, right around that time was when I met my the man who would be my husband, and when we started to think about family and stuff. So in my late twenties, um, mm. it just never really happened. So I'm going to live vicariously through my daughter, who is uh, who is an actor. And she's 24, and she's been out to LA a few times, and she's got a manager there, and uh, she's really good. She's going to do some great things. Good. Oh God, I hope I get to see her in something. That's so awesome. Yeah. Well, I'll keep you posted because you will see her in in, in some things. I'm sure of it. Mm-hmm. Awesome. I got jokes for you. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah. What did the elephant say to the naked man? <laughs> uh, it's funny already. Um, I don't know. Man, how can you breathe through that thing? It's <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> funny. Yeah, you know the difference. Okay, yes. You know the difference between a golf ball and a G spot. Mm, no. A man will spend twenty minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> I should have seen that one coming. Really? Uh. <laughs> no pun intended. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my God! <laughs> no pun intended, indeed. Yeah. Oh dear! <laughs> okay, now you you are making me blush. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You 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 feel like you met your new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like you're somebody that I wouldn't mind spending a little time with. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I I get that all the time. It just you know, I I think that one of the nerves I've hit with a lot of the people I've interviewed and stuff, you know. I mean, people who 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 are who are in acting, you know, and just show business in general, you know, they they got such a, a politically incorrect sense of humor, and I I've had that my whole life. I get that from my parents. They have the same sense of humor I do, you know. And I just got lucky that way, you know, just being myself and being the 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 the, the funny person that I can be, you know. Nice. You did get lucky that way. That's. I mean, you got, you know, it was passed passed on to you and you made the most of it. Yeah. That's a pretty awesome trait. That's, uh, yeah, that's one of, probably one of your top traits along with being compassionate. We're, yeah, we're, we're a family of free spirits. We, we, we love, you know, making each other laugh and we love, you know, being different than other people. You know, we're nonconformists in my family. Mm, which is why you're not too um, comfortable in uh, the town that you're in. Yes, which is conservative. Exactly. <laughs> but we had to. Yeah. We, we had to move up here though because you know we had nowhere else to go, and you know this this happened. It was it was fate. Yeah. Absolutely, it's part of your story. It is. It is. Well, Jane, I thank mm-hmm. you so much for coming on today. This was so much fun with you. Oh, I've had such a good time. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. It was so much fun. Yes, you're a lot of fun. And I'll talk to you soon. And I sent you a friend request. Okay, cool. I will accept it. <laughs> if I haven't already. <laughs> and Okay. Stay well, we'll, we'll be in touch. Take good care. Yes, yeah, stay safe, okay? Yeah, you bet. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. All righty. Stay safe. Stay safe. I will. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. Ciao. Bye. Well, there you have it. 
Jane Wheeler. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh my god. I do feel like I've met my new best friend. She is wonderful. I'm so glad um, that we got to talk and have a great time like we did. Welp, until next time. This is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Fire, dudes!